You're listening to Articulate with your hosts, Kevin Kramer and Sean Gillespie. Your go-to guys for art tips, techniques, and general artist ramblings. Presented by DrawingAndColoring.com. Hey everybody, welcome to Articulate, the podcast where we talk about everything art. I'm Kevin Kramer, and as always with me is my host... Sean Gillespie, how's it going? Hey, good, good to see you again. Hey, good to see you, Kevin. Yeah. <laughs> what are we talking about today? I bet everybody's curious. I bet they have no idea. I bet they don't either. And <laughs> today we're going to tackle the three rules of oil painting that everybody should know. Three rules. Three rules. Three rules. And I think you are more the expert on the oil painting than I am, so I have a few questions for you. All right. Sounds great. But before we get into those, Kevin, I want to first just go into a little bit of brief history about oil paints. I kind of like to always kind of go back and talk about definitions or the history to kind of get us in the mood. It's a nice little you... context bubble. A little context. Uh, there's a couple of interesting things. Uh, for example, uh, a lot of times the history of oil paints as we know oil paints are misattributed to the Van Eyck brothers but apparently the my resources are saying no, no. not Van Eyck no yeah sometimes uh, attributed to the master of Flamel as well okay and some people are saying that guy didn't do it either but as a matter of fact I believe your resources say that it goes back all the way to ancient China and India Is yeah that it said it was first used by the Buddhist Buddhist, okay. Painting by Indian and Chinese painters in the West. So it was used by, for the Buddhist paintings, not the Buddhist. Right. And as I understand it, it kind of started off as uh, painting for painting China and, uh, you know, tu uh, not, <laughs> not Tupperware. <laughs> so, <laughs> painting Chinese Tupperware. <laughs> Chinese Tupperware. No, no, no. For painting uh, uh, not, not the country of China, but actually your plates in China, you know, like fine China, that kind of, you know. Oh. Yeah. So, as, as I understand it, and uh, and then around the 15th century, or 15th, right. you know, 1500s, 1300s, 1400s, and 1500s, it started becoming more uh, more as we know oil paints. Exactly. But, uh, and an interesting thing <laughs> about oil paints is uh, a few things. Oh, yeah? <laughs> and, uh, it wasn't until about 1827, well, according to the uh, Ross King, uh, it was uh, about 1827 that... They started wrapping oil paints in metal tubes, uh, oh. but before that, uh, oil paints were actually housed in pig bladders. So I think I have actually heard that. <laughs> well, some resources, like on Wikipedia, they say 1841, but in Ross King's book uh, *Judgment of Paris*, he says 1827, if I remember right. But Interesting. anyway, Interesting. I thought that was crazy because uh, I can't imagine going to the store and like. I have a pig bladder of oil paint today, please. And they're like, what? oh, yes, sir. Let so it would be that. like a huge, huge bag of paint. Well, I would imagine they broke the <laughs> batter down into smaller tubes, and it was, I, I, I'm guessing, I have no idea. I would hope so. <laughs> Tube of it was like, mmm, some little boudin paint. I don't know. Uh, it sounds disgusting, so I'm glad I don't do that anymore. Yeah, uh, that, that sounds interesting. That was interesting. So, Anyway, uh, so not really a history so much as an interesting little anecdote, but it's I, just as good. I think a story is always more memorable than a lot of history. I found it fascinating. Pretty much uh, any time you stick something in a pig's bladder, I'm like, that's an interesting little factoid. I would say so. So, so what it, what are these three rules that every oil painter must use? Must use. Well, there there are three rules. All right, as you know, <laughs> as I know. Uh, but really, in my mind, and uh, maybe I'm alone here, but there, there are three rules, but they really are just one rule, right? Okay. And, uh, but I'll go over the three rules, and then I'll explain why I, I think of it as just one rule. But the three rules are fat over lean, thick over thin, and slow drying over fast drying. Those are the, the okay. three rules. Now, what that means is that... Yes. Please elaborate. Elaborate. So your thick over thin means that you want your thicker paint to be underneath your thinner layers. So you would have like your backgrounds would be a thicker, you know, paint maybe with your palette knife or whatever, and then it would be the thicker. But then when you go back over the detail, uh, or I'm sorry, <laughs> fat over lean. Beep, 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 beep. I'm talking all backwards now. I was getting a little confused there. <laughs> 
turned around. Maybe I should start over. You wanna... Let's start with Fat Over Lean. Okay. <laughs> All, All right. right. Here we go. So Fat Over Lean All right. means that you want the fat, which paint, which is the paint with more oil in it, to be on top of the thinner paint, which is paint that is is has less oil. So it's oil paints that would have been thinned with turpentine, or if you're using water soluble oil paints, it would have been oils that paints that are thinned with water, so that you have a thinner layer underneath a thicker or fatter layer, more oily layer. Okay, and the so- reason for that is you want whatever's on top to dry slower than whatever's underneath, you see? Okay, so does it, so it doesn't mix together or something like that? No, it's actually so that it doesn't crack. Oh. Um, interestingly enough, oil paint doesn't dry like acrylics do. Like acrylics, you know, you have little water molecules that are in the paint, right. and they evaporate out of the paint, leaving the pigment on the surface of the canvas. Right. But with oil paint, it doesn't work that way. It actually oxidizes the same way your car oxidizes and turns to rust, and things like that. So okay. your can literally by way of oxygen drying. So if you are an oil painter and you want your paint to dry faster and you put a fan on it, you're wasting your time. It's not going to dry any faster with a fan on it because it doesn't evaporate, it oxidizes. Interesting. The reason that I bring that up is whichever layer when it as it oxidizes it it kind of hardens, mm-hmm. right? But what happens is it's it's still settling and still kind of grooving in. Right. If you have a faster drying layer on top, or, or in this case, as the fat over lean uh, rule goes, a uh, an, a layer with less fat in it that's going to dry faster, then that layer is going to be hard while the layer underneath it is still settling, and that's going to cause the top layer to crate, crack, and break, like ice you know it's just gonna break like, on, our, on a river that, that makes a lot more sense so that's almost like the the old paintings you see in the museums that are all kind of cracked right, that's exactly well i mean they follow the rules but sometimes that's still yeah. gonna happen it's just old <laughs> but uh and then the thick over thin is the same basic rule it's saying that you want your thicker layers your thicker paint to be over your thinner paint so So that's why, and the same with slow drying over fast drying, what that's saying is uh, that that rule is more for the mediums you're using. So if you're using, you can put in... um, Now, is that... Because I know if you're using a different kind of paint, like a watercolor or an acrylic, they have uh, like a transparency factor. mm -hmm. Now, is that kind of taken into account with the thin or the thick over thin... You can add different mediums to give it more transparency and things like that. Um, but you're, you know, different oils mostly. Like you have right. lint oil, for example, is going to make your paint dry slower, but it does give it a little bit more transparency and things like that. Um, so you're, you've got these different oils and things that you can mix with your oil paint to give it different um, things. And there are also faster drying mediums mm-hmm. that you can. So you wouldn't want to use, like in this rule, slow drying over fast drying. You wouldn't want to use a faster drying medium on top of a slower drying medium. Okay. Okay. That makes. Do it the other way. You'd want this faster drying underneath. Right. So you can build it up. Right. Build it up. So that yeah, that's basically it. it gets it's confusing when you try to talk about it. Yeah. Um, so yeah. basically, what you want to do is have something dry so you can build it up on. Well, yeah, and that's why in my mind these three rules are really one rule, and the right. one is whatever is on top needs to dry slower. That's it. That's the rule. Whatever's underneath needs to dry faster. <laughs> that's a good, okay. I think that's a good simplification of it. Faster underneath. Dry fast, keep it thick on top and fatty. And yeah. then So well, then if it's on if it's thick on the top then how do you work from that? Well, traditionally, um, so this is interesting <laughs> too. So back in the day, traditional artists like Jerome and Delacroix and all those guys, mm-hmm. from and Caravaggio especially, they like would his work. They would have um, black canvases a lot of times, and they would have a very thin. Uh, their thin layer would be black, 
and those would be the darker colors. So they would work from dark to light, having the darkest color as the thinnest. And when you got, by the time you got out to the pure white highlights, those were like your thickest, laying it on with just a palette knife, you know, on hmm. top of everything else. So your white was really the thick there. And what that did is that created this illusion too of just everything falling back like these these shadows are lost and they're kind of you know can't touch them yeah <laughs> that's that's actually really uh really yeah. interesting i never knew that it's interesting and so then in the 1860s you start getting the uh impressionists and uh, or you know like manet monet um Cezanne, all those guys mm -hmm. uh, and with their palette knives, and they're not painting on a, on top of black canvases anymore. They're painting on top of you know whatever color they want. You know, mixing it up, being right. crazy. And guys are like, "What are you doing? This is this is wild stuff, man!" And uh, fat over thin. I don't know what's going on. Salon of refusés and all this. Yeah, I mean, they it was it got a little heated in the 1860s in Paris. Let me tell you, <laughs> so, Rita. A book on that that book I was mentioning earlier, Judgment of Paris, is really interesting. Oh yeah, I meant to check that one out. Yeah, Talk all about the the salon sixties and all the uh, politi political issues uh, that arose out of uh, painting. So anyway, yeah. it, not something you really think about too much. <laughs> yeah, it's not, and it's not as political these days. You can paint pretty much whatever you want, and nobody's gonna <laughs> chastise you. No, I'm just kidding. People care. They care. It's just everybody. Not, not political. But so that that's the those are the basic rules: fat over lean, thick over thin, slow drying over fast drying. But really, like I say, all one rule. Just the one. Whatever is underneath needs to dry slower than whatever is on top. Okay. That's it. now you can use. Any other brush you want. You can use rounds, flats, filberts. You can use fan brushes. I don't think you should. No? I don't like fan brushes. Eh, they're okay. You and I differ on this, but I'm not, uh, I'm not a fan of the fan brush. I'm not, I'm not a huge fan, but you know, it has its place. I, I saw an artist here in town a while back who um, he would use fan brush. He would dip it in oil and make the bristles separate and he would drag it down his painting and it was really cool looking. It created a very cool effect and that's mm -hmm. pretty much the only time I've been like I like the fan brush. Yeah. But other than that you can usually really tell uh, the fan brush. But so mm -hmm. those brushes and, and you know palette knives you know, nowadays after the 18th century, the Impressionists they really open the door you can do whatever you anything. want. Anything. Anything to a canvas except you have to make sure that you follow those three rules. That's the only thing. Because if you don't do that, your paint's going to crack and it's just going to be ruined. So, And nobody can enjoy it for years to come. Nobody. Nobody's going to enjoy a cracked up canvas. No. Now, if you want it to be cracked, then you need to get a crackling medium, which they make, instead of doing it this way. You don't want it. This, this cracking is bad cracking because this is not going to be the effect you really want. If you do right. want it to be cracked, you know, which some people do, you can get a cracking medium that will allow that to happen. Yeah, like a tempura or something like that. Yeah, maybe. maybe. I don't know. Maybe. Possibly. Maybe. Probably not. Not with oil paint, probably. <laughs> All right, so those are the three key rules to oil painting that everybody needs to follow. Yeah. Those are the main rules. They're very important. No, no, that's it. Stress that enough. <laughs> now, a lot of people, too, are concerned because they're like, wait a minute, Sean. You said I need to mix turpentine with my paint to make it thinner and all that, right? Yeah. What about that? What about that, Sean? Because turpentine is very toxic. And it says it on the can that I can get neurological damage and be all crazy. Well... A lot of concerns about that. The good news, and the good news and the bad news, is the solvents are bad for you. <laughs> yeah, I don't think anyone's going to debate that one. And it's not good for you. No. Uh, but the paints themselves now are are more or less not too bad. Now they the they are required if they have they do still have heavy metals. No paints have arsenic or lead in them anymore that I know of. Um, yeah, and I think that would be outlawed at this point. <laughs> it's pretty much out. Interesting fact, 
um, actually Van Gogh's little the rings around his, his lights. Uh-huh. Uh, they now uh, attribute that to lead poisoning because in his that mental, sense. he would actually eat his paint and he would stick his brushes in his mouth. But he also supposedly would actually sit there and eat it, and, um, and that gave him lead poisoning. And of course, you know, caused the rings around his eyes, but also you know helped. So there you go. You do drugs and you get awesome artwork. Kids, don't do drugs. Well, yeah. Don't eat ear. paint chips. I think is what that it comes down to. Paint chips, but but nowadays, I mean, you do still have paints with heavy metals in them. Uh, heavy metal, like cadmiums, cobalts. Uh, yeah, there you go. Heavy metal shirts right there. Uh, but if they do have any of these, that they are required to state that state that on the tube itself. Right. Um, but even then, the paints themselves, the toxicity of it is so low that you would have to eat almost a whole tube of it before it would make you sick. So, still be careful. Don't stick your paintbrushes in your mouth. Don't open your thing. You know, tubes, your teeth. Those you things know. can be hard to open sometimes. And but you know, get your little little open. You it's know, like a- Pliers. Sure. Things like that. Don't stick it in your mouth. And, you know, if you are sensitive. If you are sensitive to solvents and all that, they now make water soluble oil paints, which I got to say, Kevin. Yeah. I'm going to get a lot of bad mail, hate mail about this. Actually, we don't get any mail, but I, <laughs> it's on the way. Hate mail about this. Now, some people are, are the purest out there are anti-water soluble oil paints because they say that they're not real oil paints. Well, but they are. That's not true. They are oil paints. They it's, are. It's not traditional as they know it. It's not traditional as they know it. But uh, Windsor and Newton, and while they are being a little hush hush about their little process, uh, basically what they say is that they have tweaked the process of making oil paints to where now the water molecules just connect to the oil paints so they've changed it so they're Weird. they're still oil paints, but just at a at the a particular part of the process they tweaked hmm. to where now they they're water soluble so if you use those instead of using turpentine you just use water to thin it and for your thinner layers and then as you get thicker obviously you would use less water until you get to pure out of the tube and then from then you can add linseed oil to get your fatter over lean, your you fat uh, over the the leaner la- layers. Well, it sounds like that's a lot more uh, health conscious. Yeah, yeah, a lot, a lot health for conscious. sure. I'm a big fan. Of I feel like the colors are almost as pure. I feel like the spreadability of them is maybe they're they're not quite like out of the tube. They're not quite as buttery. Maybe mm, that's where you're losing it. That's where you're yep. losing it. <laughs> but they make some good, you know, mixing oils and things that you can right. with. So if you're healthy, if you're a healthy person and you're health conscious and you want to do oil painting, it's yeah. a good uh, a good alternative. Well, some of their paints still have cadmium and cobalt in them. <laughs> so it's not necessarily a health conscious thing, but if you are sensitive to solvents like I am, I'm I'm a little sensitive. Yeah. <laughs> kind of guy, I don't know if you know. But if you're sensitive to co to solvents, we need to edit that out. <laughs> it's going up. There's no taking that off. I, you've done it. You can't undo it, Sean. Damn it. Take back. But if you are sensitive to solvents, then water soluble oil paints are an option for you. All right. Oh. Good. Good deal. So I think we. Uh, I think what we. Have we le- what have we learned? Tell, tell me what you learned today, Kevin. I actually, yeah, I did learn a good bit because you are the authority on oil painting in this room so i uh i bow to your excellence all right thanks well, I had a little trouble explaining the rules there it's, it's hard to explain when you you know your brain gets all twisted around but I, but just remember kids fat over lean and that's all you really need to know thick over thin thick over that's thin right. and if you okay. can't get that one dry fast over not dry fast under dry Dry fast. <laughs> Why is that so hard to explain? It's hard to say. It is. Say, I don't think people out there. Okay. Slower drying on top of faster drying. There you go. Fast drying underneath slow drying. As the 
All right. All right. <laughs> I think that, that helps simplify it. <laughs> I think we've made people way more confused than when we started. <laughs> <laughs> Probably so, but I think uh, I think that general idea has been captured that if you want to layer anything, the bottom layer has to dry first. Yeah, there you go. That's the way to say it. Nice. Woo! And the toxicity in creating those can be a factor that you want to take into account, but they do have some alternatives that are water-based. They do. They do have now water-based oil paints that have the same brightness and beauty. beauty. Uh, because I feel like, I feel like maybe this is for me, but I feel like acrylics are just a little more dull than oil paints. And in fact, the polymers that they use in acrylics, they say can be as toxic as oil paints. So oh. that's well, food. Yeah. Something else to take into account. Well, I think we sufficiently butchered those three rules. <laughs> yeah. We're going to put those rules on the webpage. Can we do that? Yes, help? we will put the, the rules in writing below this video or the audio, wherever you're, uh, whatever you're watching or listening to this, so we can get a clear idea of what we are trying to, to say here. And uh, if you're watching on YouTube, go ahead, hit that subscribe button to your right and uh, keep up to date with these because we will get more concise. Yeah, yeah, definitely. <laughs> and also, I wanted to recommend a good book that uh, I was showing you earlier before the podcast. It is Everything You Ever Wanted to Know About Art Materials. It is a super helpful book. I, I don't know where I found it, but you can find it on our website <laughs> under the recommended readings. It's uh, Amazon links, and that has everything from the advantages, the disadvantages, to pretty much any material or tool that you can purchase for art. Yeah, and it's I'd a hell of a book. Be, be borrowing or buying that one, that's for sure. Yeah, I'll definitely send it over. <laughs> well, thanks for tuning in, guys. Yeah, thanks, and I'll uh, we'll see you next week with uh, hopefully another interview. So stay tuned. Bye. You've been listening to Articulate with Kevin and Sean. Subscribe on iTunes or check them out on drawingandcoloring.com. Always reminding you to keep it simple.